Huh? They should just be up or down. Oh, yeah. They're interested in what I said. This trap up like lock up. Looks like it, doesn't it? Hey, what happened? Your laptop just locked up, buddy. How did that happen? I don't know. I'll just say, oh, there we go. Okay. What's up, you against action out of there? Plug it back in. Yeah. I haven't done it all the time. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's just a little bit of a recall. So, you change it. Blame, uh, blame the hard one. Blame how far you set. Yeah. That's why there's going to be a few of them. Just in case. Alright. Yeah. 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 You're still going to do the demo, so get your thing up for the demo. Ah, you want to I can just do it. Well, one of those tables that you don't need. Okay. I know. I got the one that's kind of Or I mean, I have the only I never had the The one machine that we had. Okay, so I guess you all know why you're here to see the abstract. We're talking about over. So we're looking to replace our existing lib working stack with something a bit more managed, a bit more flexible. Um, there's four of us that have been looking at Over, and mostly Dabber solved the thing, and you'll take your demonstration shortly. I'm going to cover our existing set of what we're doing with Libvirt and what we're looking to replace, and all the little problems we're having. Um, and Stephen's going to give you like an, an overview of what Over actually does, and what it promises, and Dabber will show you like, what it does in practice. Okay, so. For us, the existing setup. So this was about six years ago. Red Hat bought up Kumernet, so they got a Spice and a bunch of other technologies and really put a lot of development into the KVM stack, the, the Linux kernel stack for virtualization. I'm struggling to read the font. Okay. Um, so about six years ago, we started looking at virtualization across the board for everything from servers to desktops. So for desktops, it's sort of the, the BDI space. Um, and for servers, just taking our existing hardware and virtualizing the machines just to get the usual advantages that you get out of a virtualization. So things like we wanted to divorce the service from the, the underlying hardware so we can move it around as needed and patch hardware as we need. You get a lot of little free advantages like uh, memory sharing with KSM and CPU over subscription. Um, and you package up your machines so that they're just disk images and definition files so you can move them around. They're really easy to deal with. Um, the portability and transparent thing, what we're talking about there was we had a lot of researchers that might come to us with existing virtual box images or some other image and they want to bring it to our service so that we can run it for them or they want to take it from us when they move on to their next position. So moving stuff in and out of our virtualization service was an important thing we were looking to be able to do. Um, where things started to go wrong on the desktop side was we weren't able to offer any sort of a portal. Um, basically, we spin up machines and let them SSH in and do what they need to do. That's, that's, that's the limit of our uh, portal. So um, given that, we decided really to focus on the server side stuff, just libvirt and KVM um, for services. And that's worked out really well for us. Um, in process, we've put most, if not all, of our applications onto virtual machines. So that's things like big R or MATLAB uh, machines for researchers, and also stuff for us, so like uh, Nagios monitoring and wikis and things. And we've also started moving a lot of our servers on there. So there's a lot of the web server stuff that got virtualized, and SQL servers, LDAP, lots of little things. Um, and pins, what we've got left of our mail service that we didn't move on to Fastmail is now running in a VM quite happily. Um, and then the other is just 
if anything new comes along that we want to do, the virtualization is the first place we do it. We test things out on KVM. So uh, we've got like a little cluster to teach people queuing systems like PBS and Torque. Um, any new network definitions that we come up with, things we want to test out, they're going to be ending up on our KVM stack. Okay, and yeah, we've gotten very comfortable with it. We feel that we understand it enough that we're putting critical services on it. So our stack, if you look from the bottom up, starts with storage. So everything we do comes from NFS. It either comes from NetApp or ZFS, and it's just shared out as NFS. If we think the thing is critical, like home directory storage or mail schools or something, it's going to be on the NetApp. Otherwise, it's going to be in ZFS, and it's just get yeah, big like, NFS shares set up that way. Next layer up is the actual hypervisors. So these are usually 2U Dell servers or something like that with a lot of memory, a lot of cores. And we refer to them as hosts or hypervisors, and they're pretty much hands off. We install them once, and then that's them for their lifetime. They might get occasional patches, but we really don't deal with them day to day. Everything we do is in libvirt, so moving machines around, defining new machines, uh, bringing them up and down, that's all handled by libvirt. And then at the top, we have the VMs, so that's the users are basically interacting with. And if we wanted to, say, patch one of the, the hypervisors, we would use the libvirt there to migrate everything off of that machine, then we can bring it down and patch it, do what we need to do, and then let's start migrate back. Sorry, how much of that platform do you store on the, uh, um, on the storage? So storage? The, the attached disks on those hypervisor platforms? They would appear as virtual disks and they would be mounted from NFS. So like you, on the NFS here, there would be, if, you, if I wanted to add a disk to a machine, we'd create a virtual disk image on the NFS share and then hook it up via libvirt. So they don't actually have any attached storage at all over the yeah, attached they storage. They also have an NFS, they also have like traditional NFS shares if that's what we need for them. But for the actual machine image, so like the, the root partition and all that stuff, is gonna be a virtual disk image running from NFS. So is there any local attached hard drives in the hypervisors? Hypervisors. Oh, where's it boot from? The hypervisors, yeah, boot locally, sorry. Okay. Oh. Okay, so it just has a life. But they're really dumb. Really they're really minimal. minimal. They're, right. they're, they're right. just boot loading. Yeah, just enough, enough, enough to get the KVM up and running. Okay. So can you move running VMs? Yeah. It just you get like a micro pause, so it synchronizes everything across to the next machine. Then eventually, does the network transfer? You get like a little pause during it, and it comes up to the next machine. Um, okay. So management UI, we really don't have one. It's just a bunch of shell scripts. Uh, so these VMs, as we're saying, are just disk images and some definition of what the machine looks like. So how many network cards it's got, how much memory, how many CPUs. That's just, it appears as an XML file to us. They're really simple. And then all of our uh, management is based around manipulating those two things. So we have a bunch of shell scripts that can migrate machines or create new machines. Um, and in the background, they're just using libvirt. So they're doing virtual something like that, a virtual list command. So we would connect a remote hypervisor and then run that command on the on that hypervisor and that would let me see what was running on this 120 kVM stat machine. Um, that's pretty much all there is to it. It's really simple. A couple of other things we might do, um, if we were installing a new machine, you can hook up things like VNC via libvirt and get in that way. Yeah. So do you manage any of the network? Is, is all do all the yes. stay in one subnet or is it most of the, no there's there's most of the hosts will have but uh, most of the math and stack hosts are on a single network they're on a single subnet and all of the VMs will be in that subnet I have smaller subnets so I have machines that are multi homed and then I just have the hypervisor can see more than one rich network and I can move the machines between the network so and it's all manual yeah it's all manual okay You've got to be kind of careful and yeah that's about it it's really simple so. And we feel that we understand it. There's not a lot to understand, so it's fairly easy to debug. And there's not a lot of structure there, so everything is basically driven by policies, just agreements between the people that are using it, just to make sure that we don't step on each other's toes. And a good example of that is the golden images we use. So um, by golden image, we mean we take new Red Hat, like Red Hat 7.1 gets released. We take that, strip it down, take out all the stuff we don't need, configure it the way we want it configured, syscrep or anonymize it, and then that's a read-only image that all of our machines are going to be templated. 
Um, so from those, we have these two different types of machine definitions that linked clones and full clones. Full clone is just literally copy that uh, golden image and give me, uh, I'll configure it from there. Linked clone is where the policies come in. Linked clone basically means use the golden image as a read-only copy and only store the differences. And uh, obviously, that's going to save you a lot of space. But policies come in because it's really easy to screw up. You have these family trees of images that are referring back to the image before sort of thing. And if you screw up one higher up in the chain, it takes out everything below it. I thought they were read-only. Uh, they're not read-only. They're supposed to be read-only. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, you, you can set it read-only. You cannot spin it up, but if you yeah. do some like file modicate, well, for some reason. It gets complex and you might delete a, yeah. chain, a link somewhere in that chain and it takes out everything after it. Right. They just become a pain to manage. So we have this policy of naming them so that they include each of their ancestors sort of thing. And then try and make sure you don't delete anything that's up there. But when you're tidying up at the end of the year sort of thing, you might delete the wrong thing. And then suddenly you have 20 VMs that depended on it not working. Do you take advantage of this by having a central patch, like patching an ancestor no, having? you can't because it would, like, that would be writing to the, the read-only thing. Yeah. If you patch the ancestor, it would destroy everything after work because it would know that the image has changed. So there's no way to take advantage of this sort of descendancy by not that we having a, cent a centralized patching. Not that we're aware of or trying to use. Mm. Yeah, so there's a lot of policy just trying to make sure that everybody's on the same page and doesn't, doesn't screw things up. So upside to what we're doing is pretty abstracted from the hardware. Like in principle, we are not going to be touching those hosts. Day to day, we find out that we're didn't quite live up to that, and we do log into the hosts quite a lot to make uh, configuration changes. It's really simple and transparent, um, which means it's been really helpful in debugging problems. So if we're worried about moving critical service servers onto our virtualization stack, we feel that we understand it now, because it's really simple, and we've been able to use tools like uh, Guestfish or System Rescue CD to recover from the usual sorts of problems, like full disks are corrupted corrupt. Um, and obviously the backups are really simple because we only have those two components, the machine image and an XML file. Just copy them off to somewhere safe and you're done. Um, yeah, and as I said, the hypervisors are pretty simple. Uh, simple. They're, they don't operate as portals, so there's no external users to find them. Pretty straightforward. And the downside, um, it's gotten way too easy to screw up. That was my main example is these linked clones use screw up something in that chain and take out everything below it. Um, yeah. Accidentally starting a golden image, I've done. The other thing is there's a lot of manual steps. So when we're installing a machine, we would use VNC. And last year, this came up, we forgot to turn off VNC. And it was unauthenticated VNC. <laughs> so we left a VNC port open. Somebody connected, did the control alt delete, rebooted the machine, and then they can just do it into single user mode. And that's now their machine. So we have to remember a lot of steps, turning all this stuff off to make sure that it's secure. Um, yeah, it's way too easy to shortcut these policies. They're not really enforced other than by agreement, and you can end up confusing other people. Um, so a bit laborious to manage. Um, there's a lot of connecting between different hosts to see where something's running. And there's the, one of the main ones is there's no overview. You, don't, you have to log into each of the KVM hosts, basically, or run that shell on each of the remote hosts to find out what's happening on the other systems. There's no uh, dashboard, essentially. One other thing is our storage is pretty much a single point failure. Yeah, we try and build them fairly resiliently, but it's still just one NFS shared as long. But it goes down, everything goes down. Uh, probably more importantly, from the user side, the downside is there's no portal. So there's a lot of things we just can't offer. Um, a lot of things get propagated to us as support requests that probably shouldn't. The users can't turn off or on their machine. Well, they can turn them off, but they're not turning them back on again because they don't have a presence on the KVM hosts. Um, monitoring is whatever the guest gets you to do to actually, actually log in, run IO stuff. They're not going to be getting a dashboard and seeing that their machine's going crazy for a reason that they don't understand. Um, as I said, remote access is SSH by and large. Yeah, they can log in, run some commands. In rare cases, they might get RTP or VNC or something else uh, if they need it for some reason. 
Um, remote console has more actually of an admin problem, and what I mean by that is if their networking goes down, they have no out of band management. We sort of do, but because that's through the host and the users aren't defining the host, the users don't. Um, and the other thing, it refers back to the admin stuff, the possibility and the actuality of orphaned machines. So a researcher will spin up their machines for some project and then they've got no overview of them, so they just leave them running and we don't know if they're like up for a reason or if they're just up because they forgot about them. The user doesn't know that either. So is the remote console is that a real problem? It's a problem for like us. It's just, yeah. I yes, mean, it doesn't come up that use often for users, but it is a problem for us. Oh, that there's no out of band way of, like, well, it's something we use. There's no, there is no out of band mechanism. Like KVM or some sort of KVM or... And because they have no dashboard, it yeah, ends up as a lot of emails. You don't know if the machine's down or networking is down or what the problem is. Okay, and um, that's where we are with our the Burt setup. So Stephen's going to talk about over. <coughs> okay, so, yeah. let's discuss uh, the use of um, set of dust versus the other storage. And um, we're just a bit more sure of the NetApp storage, so we would use it where we're really worried that data loss would be a, a problem. Um, ZFS, we use it. It's cheap, like SATA disks and stuff. So if somebody wants a lot of scratch space for like some project they're working on, that's where it will come from. And we've been slowly sort of moving stuff to the ZFS as we get more comfortable with it. But there's still a feeling that it's the NetApp is almost somebody else's problem. Like when a disk dies or something, it's a support request through NetApp that the disk appears and everything just continues to look on it where it is. Is it your NetApp? It is. Okay. So, yeah. So here, as uh, so if you think about the ZFS, we have one of the box just um, got the call them last week, and it's been running like 400, 500 days. And just one of Blue Moon, they decided to, like some reason they could do the call them, we still don't know why. But the NetApp, they just run years and years, and they, I have no problem with that. So that's why we choose to use the NetApp for, for the, uh, the, the image itself, because we know we need to be up all the time, right? So. Uh, do you take advantage? I know NetApp has some block size block style deduplication, which would help really if you got like zillions of, of images, um, that block deduplication could help you a lot. But I haven't dealt with the NetApp stuff. Well, we, tried yeah, it ZFS. we tried it in ZFS and found it wasn't worth it because more problems than we solved. So ZFS deduplication requires like at least two to three times the memory of yeah. the storage, so it's a lot of memory. Oh, I and see. It does and also it's ZFS it's is really a uh, open Solaris or Linux is an NFS system. But NFS isn't built properly. I run VMware with NFS on the NFS systems and there are performance issues and weird issues that I, I don't know what's causing other hardware software. So then I have boxes just work. Mm -hmm. No question about it, it just works. Yeah. Okay. Actually, Tay, how many how many VMs can VM VMs that you guys currently run? Oh in total we got Roughly about 200 VMs, and we have like maybe 30 uh, uh, nodes. Okay. 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 So, <clears throat> sort of uh, after uh, all the trials, of course, that Ian, Tay, and Dab have been experiencing with their current KVM implementation, over. Uh, the promise is to help alleviate some of those issues. Um, by you know, basically providing a mechanism so people can uh, admins like us can manage uh, VMs or storage, um, provide that sort of dashboard and console um, that would not normally be available in KVM, and of course, uh, open source. So avoid the licensing. So. Over, over at a very high level is really um, is a poor man's vSphere VMware implementation or Hyper-V, um, or sorry, and really, really, it's to try and provide an or orchestration me uh, mechanism so you can manage all your VMs, um, and the promise is to really provide and simplify management life. Now, the key features. Uh, is A, to provide a web console, so for both the admin and also for the user console, so they can go in and see their own individual VMs 
what's allotted. Uh, help simplify some of the management tasks of spinning up VMs, uh, managing your storage, managing the networking, um, provide some kind of monitoring, alerting mechanism so you can quickly overview how your VMs are doing, um, know whether it's been uh, kernel panicking or not, and all the other little bits here that you guys can take a look at. Now, in terms of the architecture, it's based off of KVM, basically over it's a, a real fancy uh, wrapper for a lot of different KVM-esque uh, technologies, uh, provides additional tools, um, works with Kimu, BDSM, which is the virtual uh, desktop server manager, um, and provides the fan fancy GUI, your storage domains to manage all of your, say, VM templates, the physical data files, ISOs, as well as a database to track all of those in place uh, changes that you're making to track your state of your environment. A directory server, which would be either AD or OpenLDAP, uh, to provide all your user authentication. Now, it's important to note for Overt has one admin user. That's a local user. You cannot create local users uh, within over from what we found, you have to use a directory server like OpenLDAP or ADM or IPA. Um, and then the networking bit to manage your physical logical points. Now, from a graphical standpoint, so you technically have your, so here's your, here's your, all your, your sort of your KVM, VDSM, libvirt aspects of Either and you have two choices. You either have your host, which is uh, CentOS, typically a CentOS server, very minimal, and then you essentially run the uh, over engine onto it, um, or the hy hypervisor, which the hy hypervisor can be provided by Overt, which is a very minimal uh, implementation of, of Linux. Then from there, you, uh, all of your changes are stored within a PostgreSQL uh, server. Active, as mentioned earlier, your LDAP, IPA, Active Directory, and then all your, your Edge devices. The communication for the console access runs over Spice, uh, or VNC, or HTML5, which is still in works. Um, but in the center of it, it's basically running a Java process that provides all the GUI. That's yes. Yeah. Can you add existing KVM hypervisor boxes that have Yes, you can. There's an import There's an import and export method. Um, Ian actually went through a little bit of. So, so this sort of this replaces all your scripts? Yeah. Yes. So you can still have control of the KVM box yes. without over you running, essentially? You can. You probably don't want to. Yeah. yeah. You definitely want to import them in to that environment. And it's stored in the yeah. database. The yes, that package. would actually track all that. That's correct. And it also it's tracked, stores. but it's not stored. Not stored. Okay. It tracks. Oh, yeah, it's it's all the yeah. So yeah. the machine descriptor still lies in the own file, or it's actually importing into the database. It would be, I believe, it's actually stored within the. There's actually the. Okay, the story. The way uh, over actually stores information. So yes, in terms of the the whole VM environment of your, of say like your small little cluster, all of that's maintained within the database. But the actual VM definitions, I believe, are actually stored in flat files that are stored in various. In, in, so in the way that we've set it up, the VERP still has a role to play. So your machines still get defined as XML, but that's transient. It's store, it comes out of the management engine's database. So you define like three CPUs, this much memory. Whenever you make an instance of that VM somewhere, it's going to get turned into an XML file for libvirt and defined on that host temporarily while the machine's running. There's nothing persistent in libvirt's whole persistence in management. So, over does it manage the storage and networking? Because I see that you have to access the console through another device, not through over. So, does over manage oh, no, the storage that connects with KVMs? Well, you manage it a couple ways. So typically, over it has a, both a CLI uh, uh, mechanism in place that you can do all of your uh, management tasks, or through the actual web GUI, through HTTPS. 
Oh, no, that's right. Consoles. In, in terms of the host themselves, like, yes. over manage, yes. bring a host up and yeah. manage all the hardware and all the stuff, like the networking and the storage attached to those hosts without having console access directly. And then add it to the overall system. Does it do that? That's the idea. Like, yeah. the KVM hosts become just commodity. Oh, but over doesn't set up that KVM host, right? You do something to manage do it and then import it? No, that or does it wait, do wait for that one to come yeah. out. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Just, okay. That's pretty well. Yeah. With that. So, um, anyways, um, so Obert really has kind of so these are the major uh, components of Obert versus your physical and logical resources. Um, the concept of your data center, so that would when you're looking at your view um, clusters, um, we have not in the got looked at the clustering aspect because that's still I think uh, needs more development, but we haven't actually implemented it. Um, your logical networks hosts your storage pool uh, for your physical images, uh, your templates. So your templates being like what, if this is going to be a CentOS, CentOS, and whatever other bits that you're going to add to that image. Um, your snapshotting, various user types. Now, um, Overt has a very uh, granular. Uh, ability to specify what people can and cannot do, and that would be set within your directory. Um, whether they can spin up access VMs, what kind of amenities they have, so it can actually uh, really break out. Uh, your event monitors, and then of course reports. Now, for system requirements, uh, actually the overt itself is actually very minimal um, in terms of what its requirements are. Um, you can actually spin it up on uh, really cheap machines. Um, now, of course, for large deployments, the more resources you throw at it, it will probably be uh, uh, more favorable. Um, but in terms of OS support, really, um, in terms of guests or even as your, ho as your host or, or hypervisor, you really are kind of in the CentOS world. You can, those guys have spun up on Gen 2 or Debian, um, but realistically, this is a CentOS red, red hat. Where does the Overt live in a VM? Yes, okay. yes. So uh, as uh, when Dabber goes over uh, the demonstration of spinning up, so basically on the bare metal, if we're talking bare metal, you have it installed with your, say, minimal, uh, if it's gonna run as a host, you, you have a very basic uh, Linux installation, and then you install the Overt engine on top of it. Okay, so Overt must live on every hypervisor platform. And is there another component that orchestrates all of these sort of platforms? Or I, I, I just am yeah. not clear on the yeah. uh, organization. Yeah. So uh, I, I took out a slide, but actually, uh, okay, so for um, Overt itself, so Overt, well, so you have uh, actually a host engine. Um, that will you know, so you could either have one or two or more or more host engines. You would install that on a bare metal Linux server. On top uh, of that, no, 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 no. no you would. Strong. Okay, so like this, you have the, uh, the 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 host engine. You can only have one hosted engine, and that's a point of failure. Okay, only one hosted engine, and then from the hosted engine, you you can create more hypervisor and go and which is a node. Wait, so yeah. you're creating more hypervisors or more yes, okay. hypervisor. Okay, so I think so we should make this one bit double when when we yeah. when we <laughs> I think easier. Yeah. Their terminology is not always consistent. Yeah. But the what they call engine is the management that is the controller. Okay, that's the highest level of management. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, then you have compute nodes, which is your which is your boxes that have hypervisor and run VMs on them. Okay. Uh, each of those compute nodes has an agent, which is the VDSM, which talk which the controller talks to. Okay. And tells it now start this, now start okay. that, so how are you doing? Over it actually comes in two chunks. One one is the overall management, and one is the hypervisor or compute node or whatever you like on each uh, on each hypervisor platform. Okay. Yeah. So, and with that actually, because um, there's always the, there's the question of, say, what, the one that you install as, say, your head, if that head hardware goes down, um, there, 
over it has the ability because it actually spins up a management VM that you would actually be able to move between your different machines to be able to access. Oh, so are these things more like peers? They negotiate among them. We haven't experimented with yeah. it, but we haven't actually experimented they, with it. There, it, it seems a lot of people are uh, starting to use this what they call the hosted engine, where the management node is actually just running in a VM. And then apparently, according to their slides, uh, the different compute nodes, if they notice that the controller, the management VM, has gone down, they'll start another one. Um, and if they notice that the uh, compute node where the management VM was being run went down entirely, um, they'll decide amongst themselves which one should start running nice. the new management VM. Okay. And so they claim five minute stops to get your controller back. And once go down, your VM will still running. So yes. not no right. to worry about it. Okay. So that's what my question was. Can yeah. you virtualize? Over management, that's yes, right. And it manages to spin it up as it goes down. If it does go down, right, automatically. That's what their that's what their sites okay. say. Yeah. As so there's been always only one. Been tested. Okay. As there's, it has been yeah. There's only it's, always it's, only one running. Yeah. Only one. But one supposedly, one. if if you have the uh, everything set up, they, they will restart it if it goes down. So the version we use right now, 3.62, which already have that function, but they decide to drop it on the last minute. Uh, so you know, for, for some uh, cluster FS reason, it's not the ver the hosted engine reason because the cluster FS they could not get it going. Then they dropped up that option in the 3.62, but they promised 3.7 they will bring it back. So as touched briefly as well. So for the over uh, user management, these are the various actual uh, server directory server technologies that are supported. Now, for the uh, maybe I can hand this over to Daver. Um, but the demonstration. So this is a look at the hardware. This is what uh, is sitting in in Tay's area. Uh, for the setup, we had two Dell servers, storage interconnected uh, to the JBODs with 10 gig inter interconnects, and over a uh, another Dell switch. And I think we'll go into the Dever section. Yeah. Okay, so. Our, our current setup is very POC. Uh, we just wanted to see how well it runs with minimum of tweaks. And so the previous slide said there is there's only two, uh, two nodes that run it. Um, so before I get into the demo, there was a few steps that I already did, but there was minimal tweaking involved. Uh, so first, in order to install the engine, uh, which controls all the uh, hosts in the, in the cluster, uh, all I did was I, I uh, did a minimal install of uh, Red Hat 7 onto, a, uh, onto one of those two Dells. I added the uh, over repo, 3M, installed this one package, which came with a whole bunch of dependencies, uh, and then I ran the command. Uh, it includes the command uh, over tangent, and I just started that. And there is a uh, it's a text based uh, configuration <coughs> dialog where it asks you a whole bunch of things. The only things that I changed, I I, I used defaults for everything. Uh, all I had to do was I chose uh, my admin user credentials and I told it not to set up its own local NFS. Uh, I was going to do that uh, manually. So that was that. That got the engine running. Um, and it, it doesn't take long. Um, but it still doesn't have any, it's not using any storage yet and it's not uh, using any, uh, it doesn't have any uh, compute nodes in the cluster. Uh, so on uh, 
uh, on an OmniOS machine, I set up the uh, NFS shares for our production use, like they described. We, we use uh, a NetApp, but it was, I had a, a, this uh, OmniOS machine uh, sitting in the same rack and, and not being used for anything else yet, so I just, it was way easier to do that. Um, and then in the management console, I'm not showing you this, these parts. I added uh, this, what they call storage domain. Uh, there is three different types of storage. Uh, and uh, one is uh, data, which is used for uh, VM images. One is ISO, which is used for uh, ISOs that can be attached uh, to your VMs. And one is export, uh, which is used for importing and exporting uh, VMs. Uh, so I created those domains, and I also added a, a compute node, which uh, I, I used the, the uh, first the machine where the uh, the engine was already running. So I just pointed it to itself, and I gave it the root password uh, for that machine. And the second Dell um, in our two, two, uh, two machine cluster, I did the same thing. I told it this is uh, where this is its IP and this is the root password. And um, the engine connects to those two machines uh, through SSH and installs all the uh, packages it required, um, uh, which included uh, virtualization. So uh, KVM, uh, all the packages it, it needed, plus the um, overt uh, agent or BDSM, Sorry. which it needs to, to talk to. I don't understand what it actually created there. Okay, so you said you on the same um, platform that you installed overt, you, you created a compute node. So in other words, you I told it to use uh, the same machine also as a compute node. So the machine where I was already running right. the engine, I told it to also use it as a compute node, right? Um, which creates which creates a hypervisor platform so that it can accept um, to the so creation of VMs, more yeah. guest OSs. Yeah. Okay. In, in their setup, the engine isn't a VM. They're right. Just like the basic. So yeah. is this what they call the self-hosted option? Uh, you can use no, they actually the, the confusingly enough. Hosted engine is the one when it's where it's run in a VM. Right. Here, I don't know what they call this one, but this is where the engine runs on our on a hardware. regular hardware yeah. host. Yeah. Yeah. It is called, I think, just host. Okay. Um, <laughs> An overt host as opposed to the over hypervisor engine. So they, they need to. Uh, Clean up their clean up their terminology. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Strangely, in that respect, uh, uh, OpenStack is is fine, lot clear. Anyways, um, and then I also uploaded uh, an ISO image, which was just a Red Hat full installer, uh, which has to be done through the uh, uh, command line interface. And that part is it's right. Oh, at this step, you can actually choose your own OS. No, no, I, I, uh, in order to create a, a, a VM, I need to install something to it. Yeah. And so what I did is, I because I wanted to uh, do a Red Hat install on a VM, right. um, I just uh, included uh, an ISO image of a Red Hat right. install. I'm saying at this step, you can choose, for example, if you want a free BSD, just Throw in a free yeah, uh, the, uh, you upload it as a Windows one, right? So at this stage, you that's when you create your, your yeah. Okay. yeah. So so uploading ISOs for I, I guess they just don't have it implemented. That's one of the few operations that has to be done through the command line. There is no uh, uh, option through the uh, admin console in the uh, in the web. That plus what is the other one? It's the same for uh, importing and exporting machines. Things like that. Right. Okay. So, not to scare you, this is the part that I really wanted to cover. We we chose some really simple setup, and then I 
just had to add uh, the other nodes in, in the cluster so that I can show you, um, show you the demo itself. So the second box just had a base Red Hat install. Bo both of these machines started off as a minimal, minimal Red install. Hat, yeah. minimal Red Hat Seven, <coughs> and uh, over added all the KVM setup that was needed to, for them to, to uh, host VMs. So for this uh, host VM, let's um, there's that recent DNS problem. Is there any way that, or this box is completely cleaned up? There's no way that that they, whether you patch it or not, could fall prey to this, or there which is some, the, the, the recent, uh, no, uh, no, but, but which, which box? Uh, so, the overt. Um, the minimal so red hat. So minimal red, red hat. Yeah, so, so you need to actually, you said that once you install it, you can basically consider it a sealed box, black box, so it's done. You can't, you can't do anything. Lipsy's part of the base, so you don't touch it. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you, you would just uh, run the amount of tapes. It just becomes easier. Patch it, and then let it stop from Okay. So yeah, I'll just run run Yamate. Uh, here we install the packages that need to be installed. Right. Yeah, I just want to know how sealed the seal. I mean, is it, there's no you, remote. You access. actually have still have to expose uh, port 80, port 443. Mm -hmm. So that is where your vulnerability is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you're going to allow some RDP or whatever uh, through the uh, hook, to through the VM itself, right. then another port you can do a block. And, and over it itself actually is quite componentized. So you could run uh, the engine on one machine or in a VM. Your, uh, the Apache that is providing the, uh, the, the UI, the web UIs, uh, for both for the user user portal and the admin console that could be running on another machine. Uh, there is proxy for the console access, which could be running on the third machine, so it, it could be broken up. I, I, I didn't go there. Um, so basically you can narrow that to a host to expose to the outside, right? And the rest is stay behind the firewall. Do you have to shut down all your VMs while you're patching the yeah. other? Migrate. Migrate, yeah. Oh, I see. Migrate off. Yeah. Migrate off. Migrate off. Migrate off. And, and that's why you keep it as minimal as you can, because mm -hmm. any any of the software that has a hole in it that you're running, you need to patch for, whether it's KVM or the kernel, or the DNS or GLC or anything. So when you do migrate, I, you said it's momentary. I mean, how? When you say momentary, you mean 10 seconds? And like Probably less than 10 seconds. Because um, you have to copy all the memory. Uh, yeah, you? but it yeah. doesn't have to you know, migrate until it's happened. So copy is like 99% of the, what it can sort of thing, then freezes and does the last. Oh, I see. Right. It tells which one's left. But the, the hypervising thing is going to become more of an issue if we have a portal, because most of the YUM updates that we need a reboot for our hypervisors or kernel, or their privilege estimations, and we don't have non admin users on the machines, there's nothing, we don't need to patch at that stage. But now that these are going to be portals, in principle, we have users to find on them, we will well have to do so. That's going to be more regular for us. Okay, so this is the admin uh, portal. It actually has the notion of having different data centers, and then you can define st storage and, and hosts per data center. We have no need for that, so we just use the default center that it comes with. I define those three uh, storage domains, which are just three, three NFS shares that I set up uh, with on my ZFS box. Um, and then I didn't muck with the networks. You can define your own networks, logical um, and VLANs. We, I just used the default one, which means that everything um, uh, goes over uh, over the uh, regular network that connects the, the physical machine. Can you expose the uh, network? Yeah. Yes. Uh, not until yeah. there. There, there is no, yeah. And then, I don't really uh, know about these multiple clusters, but 
again, we only have one. Uh, hosts are the two nodes, uh, the compute nodes that are part of this cluster. And then VMs list all the current uh, VMs, active and inactive. And so if I wanted to, if I had a new, new host, if I uh, got another box uh, sitting around, um, again, it would have to be a Red Hat CentOS um, uh, OS running on it. Uh, I think Fedora too. I could just say, uh, new host, uh, give it the address. Uh, and uh, the password of the root user. Alternatively, um, but you need to go through that minimal install on that new host. Yeah, if, if I had a, a host, it doesn't need anything more than a minimal Red Hat uh, setup. Oh, I could so add you need to, to add that over, or you don't even need that. You just no, set it up. You just install it. The less, install the less the there is on it, the, the better, right? Yeah. So the best is just to install a minimal uh, CentOS Red Hat OS, and then tell over it, uh, connect to it, and you know, have your way with it. It's all through SSH. Add, it would use the SSH, yeah. So, yeah, so, so your compute node would need to have SSH. 422 SSH running, which it will uh, by default, and also you can't disable root access for the remote user. Um, right. uh, storage domains, same thing. I, it, it's not terribly interesting when uh, we're looking at uh, Storage. Um, there is once you have these three types of domains: one for your images, one for your ISOs, and one for that is somehow just used for for uh, uh, exporting uh, VMs out of over. Uh, there is nothing else to do. I th it may get more interesting if if you're using uh, uh, <laughs> ClusterFS. Uh, but we, we're not doing it. Um, it. It's not the most responsive user interface. Um, it's a little disappointing, but it is what it is. If you want to add more storage, like expand it, um, you can just add more on those. I assume you could just add, well, yes, you would just add another new domain. I think you can, well, at least based on the fact that it only gives me an option to create data domain here, it may be that you have to have only one ISO domain and only one export domain. But data domains, you can just add one. Like by enlarging machines idea of storage, or? Well, just the available pool of storage. I, I, I don't have. think over cares, right? It just yes, says it is whatever it's being fed. Yeah. It is what it is. Yeah, what an NFS is serving says you have 10 gigs. Your NetApp box, though, however, would potentially expand that yeah, or whatever you're using to expand. Uh, we, of course, haven't tried the, well, if you did expand the, the existing storage domain, does it quickly reflect within Overt that it's available? We don't know. We'd have to check. It should. Does the storage options allow for any sort of replication? Yeah, if you're using uh, cluster, cluster you have to use cluster surface. Yeah, have to so use cluster. Is that feature cluster not over? Um, yeah. So if you don't, then if you move a machine from one store to another store, it copies it. It will take a long time. Yeah. Probably. I mean, we only use one domain for for, for storing VM images. So all the difference between this and KVM is that over now can do the storage um, yeah. migration, right? Whereas our KVM, the old one, you, we cannot do that. And the, migrate, the storage migration, we don't even need to use the FS. You can use the normal NFS. If you have a two NFS, you can migrate from one to another, OK? So they do, the way they do, they do the snapshot from your storage, they move on your, uh, all of the uh, existing, um, just like, um, Catches go to that um, snapshot, 
and then they dump, they copy the hardware, the, I mean the storage over. The last one they dump the different into the storage. So that's how the storage migration. So all the more advanced features for the storage are targeted the cluster. Yeah, yes. this is the end of using cluster if you want. So the, the data domain, let's say we're talking about um, the data domain, you can have many backends. Let, let's say you have multiple NetApps, and you can then say um, the data domain, all the images is on, spread out over these separate. No, I don't think it's that sophisticated. I don't think, that, I don't think it's that sophisticated. I think each of your different NetApps would be a new. Um, uh, data storage domain, and then oh. over it would somehow keep track but of you what's tagged them all as data yeah. uh, type domain. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is there any sort of policy manager from the over? Does it warn you with, when storage is overloaded, or does it spit have, out the it spit based off yeah. resource allocation? Does there any sort of that far? Um, is there any? Well, in terms of resource management, in terms of like spinning up the VM, does it does over have any management resource management capabilities like VMware? Because VMware makes it very easy to allocate spin up VMs based off of what uh, hosts are being used and what's not being used, and it spins it on and automates the migration of VMs based off. Of Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This one has, has when you come to that migration. migration. Oh yeah. well, like no, it's not. It doesn't automate the migration. You have to say move this VM somewhere else. Yeah. That's the quietest sort of it. Like there are some, there is some policy for it. Will like if you start five VMs and they all went to the, yeah. the first hypervisor, your next one's an empty. Your next VM's going on empty. Yeah, so it sort of balances. Yeah. For you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't well, know that it doesn't. It doesn't do it. Auto yeah. Once a VM is running yeah. somewhere. Unless you tell it to move somewhere else, it's not going to move somewhere else. So there's no policy to define, you can define I, I don't, I don't think there is, so but so I, uh, we didn't look into it that yeah. deeply. Later on when he moved, he showed you the, 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 the VM. There is an option for you to do a failover within the VM itself. Okay. So, yes. So there's yes. Right? yes. So when you click on that one, they will, if, if the, the hypervisor fall, they will move that VM to a new hypervisor. So okay. there are some. Uh, so there's, right. well, there's not a glorified you GUI yeah. for the command line. Okay. Is that true for storage too? Like, can you move? So we, we, we didn't try storage yet. Oh, okay. right? Because right now we use only one storage. I suspect, I suspect we were telling to use both. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Then when you run a VM, you have to create a new VM. You just get, get a dialog. I mean, if you ever created VMs in a virtual box, it's not that different. Um, and it's just, you can create the image that's used. There's a thin provision right there, right? So and the pre-allocation, right? So it's very similar to uh, to the VMware. Uh, what what is the file system format that you can have? Is it is it VDIs or VDMs, VMKs or what kind of? QCal2. Yeah, just use. But it. can you use like VirtualBox images? You can use import. You have to convert it to import it. Yeah. You would have to import it, and we had to make success with that. And here I can attach the any of the ISOs I talked about earlier. I can enable boot menu. Can you kind of, can you click on the high availability? See if you can. Availability. Yeah. See if you the high available. We see that check right there. Basically, if if you click on that, they will migrate your VM if the hypervisor die, like whatever. Right? They will move to the next available one. But you cannot do live migration if you have one check. Okay, you leave it to the to the over engine gonna control your VM. And appears there is a well, we know that there is a way to link this with other providers or uh, I don't know what to call it, Foreman, which actually manages your uh, VMs for you, and then Satellite, which is yet another. Uh, Layer, we, we haven't done any of that. We're just running this on its own. 
So while he mentioned the foreman, foreman basically is a kickstart. Okay, so if you want to get, move your hardware to data center and just hook it up a wire, you run foreman, they will run all the bare, ma bare minimum OS for you, and then it will incorporate into the overt. That's very useful. That that we want to try that later. And not free. What? Foreman's not free. Foreman's right. not free. So I right? you, you can find a way to make it work. If you need. What do you mean foreman is not free? It's an open source product? Yeah, they're open yes. source. Yes. Are you thinking of something else? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that does offer a support thing. Is it uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, it's called satellites, not free space for the free version. Yeah, because they're working on it. Oh, so while we create, this is a, when you log in as you, you that's what you're going to see. Okay, so you log in, you will see all of your VM over here, you can spin up and spin down or whatever you need to do with that. That's a user um, login. So yeah, that's a, that's a user portal. Yeah, that's a user portal, where, that's what it looks like. Uh, the, there's different uh, access to management rights that can be assigned to individual users and which may include just them accessing their own yeah. VMs that have been assigned to them, or um, creating new ones up, up to some limit. Right? In, in theory, there is. How do the event logs look like? This is Java. Uh, this is Java. <laughs> <laughs> Java exception. Is that what it is? Exception. Exception. Depends on what you're looking for, looking at. If you're looking at the, all the UI aspects of what the same work, yeah. engine's yeah. doing, well, yeah, it's all, it's a huge mess in various areas. Well, let's say that I want to find out who's spent 100 VMs for no reason. You can, you can oh, yeah. that, right? Yeah, look. See, on your admin console, right there, yeah. you can tell. Memory, yeah. CPU, who the heck is using what, right? Yeah, the only thing is, for some reason, I'm, oh, there you go. Successfully, uh, Oh, there it is. It says VM test was created by min at internal. Okay. The event I can. Okay. Starting up. Uh, there is also a REST interface. So a lot of it could be either automated or turned back into a command line, a bunch of command line scripts that use this interface to control the, uh, to talk to the over uh, engine rather than going through this sound. Uh, this interface. So what about management of the resources? Uh, part of uh, the desire for an interface is that you can give uh, users a chunk of resources, not the whole thing. Can you? How easy is that to do and how does it work? It should be, like there's a quota system, so you set up like a good 18 gig of space, get as many CPUs, as much memory, and then you assign it to the users. And it's, the way that it's designed, it should be very flexible, you can assign it to VMs, templates, data okay. centers, and all that stuff. Okay. We had limited success getting it to work. No. It is supposed to be there. Okay. And Red Hat supports this as a like the actual their version of it that presumably works for them. There would be something as well, right? Okay. <laughs> we just didn't configure it properly. Okay. Right. That's yeah. Okay. Probably after the demo, we'll redo this cluster again from scratch. Yeah. So see. they release with them. 3.6.3, right? Okay. As of like a few days ago. So then the very fast moving target, right? I mean, we're going to have to redo this one and see how far we can take it. Have you guys done any comparisons with like a VMware product? Like see what the advantages and disadvantages are for both? We don't have money to spend on VMware to test. We looked at them on paper. We have spun off the VMs. But by comparing on paper, have you seen any major differences? Yeah. And you mean features or yeah, desirable features? Mm -hmm. Features you wish are pretty much all the same. Yeah. Like as long as everything works, the features are. So provided everything works as advertised, it does everything you would want it to. Yeah. Do. Yeah. yeah. If you compare paper to paper, yeah. this yeah. is the, opti the ultimate. You want it, right? But then you know, when you go to detail, lots of bugs, lots of small things that doesn't work. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Is there any uh, virtual network? Management capabilities. Yes. You yes, you can. A bunch of VMs to a virtual switch and. Yes. So, so that's why there, there is a tab for networks where you can define your networks. It's not something we went in, into, uh, but you can create logical networks 
and assign VMs to those networks so that we can have a subset of VMs running on one logical networks being able to talk to each other. Makes it faster. This is just, just a wrapper on the libvert uh, network interfacing? I'm guessing so, yes. yes so it's not like open v switch or anything? No. Yeah, let's see, where's my... So see, you can have... Oh, come on. Let's try to do that. Let's do that. Um, this is way slower than it usually is. You can also... Uh, it's maybe... Nicer if I show you another VM. With a virtual console. Yeah, so uh, this is the virtual console uh, running uh, in HTML5. It, it's not handling the text mode very well. It actually works yeah. better in, in the graphical mode. And the console uh, sucks. Yeah. The like even, even I have the window. It's claimed to have very good client, but it's still not very good yet. So I found a... Uh, uh, um, about to Red Hat because UBC have premier um, support and they now have a team going to investigate this one for us so hopefully they're going to do something about it. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh god. We need to get rid of ours. All of them. <laughs> My mom's going to sweat. Yes. <laughs> Thanks Michael. Yes. Don't bring up nightmares man. <laughs> It's really interesting on the Slayer's box, it's pretty horrible to drink. That's well. Nice and slow. If we need a heater, they can pick them up. So overall, you got an 885, which is pretty good <laughs> after using it for a little bit. Or out of that. Would you put it in production, Ted? Almost. Pardon? Over. Oh, that's later on when we final. We're going to say it. <laughs> just, just wait. Just wait for the conclusion. So there you go. This is, the, uh, this is another VM we already had. Set up, except the text mode doesn't work very well. Do you have the Lubuntu one? Yeah, I have the Lubuntu one here. Uh, uh, let's see. Let me talk around this. So it supports RDP or or VNC or VNC and Spice and Spice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Go for VNC. No, VNC is the HTML one, the HTML5 one that runs in the browsers. So does a standalone VNC work better? Yes. Yeah. You can. You can. So basically, when you the, the interface, when you click on it, they download a definition of your VNC, like the password, what port to go in, and then and, and and then you know you if you do the, the, the standalone one, you have to read that file, enter the port, enter the password. Yes. Not very secure, basically, you know, because the password is clear text. Right. But it's temporary. Yes, the defines like is just using VNC directly connected to VNC. So if you like a temporary password, mm. set on that. Oh, I see. It creates a, a one-time yeah. instance for it. It disappeared in one twenty second. Yeah, I don't know what uh, and you what same, user same, you set up on same, it. Same, same, same. Yeah, but same. I mean, you oh, can so see you, that you do use the management console to generate a VNC yeah. instance, and then you go fire that off into the VNC viewer. That's yeah, the so you can run a standalone VNC viewer or. Um, yeah, see them? All the text go crazy. Yeah, well, yeah. 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 the OSX client even worse than the window. Right? Yeah, except this is the HTML5 client, so yeah. either the HTML. Yeah, the, the, the client, the very. 5 is not that great, or. Because the HTML5 is a tank. We saw that we see this yeah, it's tech free. That's true. Uh, you can uh, just pick an NC to work for one of the ones in our capital. All right. Yeah, let, let, let me just show you migrating a VM, uh, how easy it is. Migrate to another host. So you say that the uh, migration is, is instantaneous, but that's really. Yeah, you're you're saying that the downtime isn't complicated, yeah. but when you start a migration, it's still going to get a whole lot of memory over to the next person. Right, and that will take, that's that's take two days. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's not, let's see how soon it, oh, there it is, migration completed. Just under a minute. Okay. And, you and know, that the, is proportional really to how much memory you have? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so start. I like the actual downtime, 122 microseconds. <laughs> it's okay. There you go. That's, um, pretty sweet. that's yeah. it for, for the demo, really. Yeah. Uh, have you played much with uh, what, different migrating different loads? Um, yeah, it's yeah. a game where we'll migrate something oh, and is. other things on it. I think the same will be true. We've done it in practice with Libvirt, but these ones are all tests, so there's nothing great going on. So, this is the uh, uh, VM install I started earlier with a CD attached uh, uh, Red Hat install uh, DVD, and I just ended up in the uh, in the install dialog. So to it's answer you, I have a machine with uh, 32 CPU migration, and they all are 100%. I have that migration, is still OK. It, take, it, it would take maybe five minutes or so. Under load? Under load, yes. OK. Yeah. The worst case scenario is big, yeah. big, 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 big. Yeah. 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 Well, actually, does swap make a difference? Because With this guy, it's on disk. Yes. It's on a virtual disk. Yes. I'm sure they wouldn't really have to copy it. Uh, we also have a <coughs> Pixie Boot plus Kickstart uh, system in place that we've been using, and you could also install your uh, VMs using that instead of through the uh, install dialog, which is pretty handy. Um, what is else? Cloning and templating, sort of. Yeah. There is template templating. I haven't played with it, uh, but I believe when you stop a VM or shut it down. Yeah, now they're about to stop. So for that, I believe you can say blah, 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 blah. you can clone it, obviously, and you can make a template out of part of it. I don't know what's if there's any uh, for wrinkles to it. For some of the Windows stuff, it's sysprep where we do some sysprep stuff as well. We have a Windows machine. Uh, it's not running great. The uh, so it, oh, for Windows machines, you can actually have remote desktop. Yeah. So uh, let's just do it through Spice. Yeah, don't do it with the spice. That, just that, that ends up being that's a pain. It kills the uh, VM, I think. Well, it doesn't kill it. It, no. it shoots the uh, CPU up and basically locks it up. So performance-wise, it's not too much. It's, not, it's no different from any KVM in your command line. It's, it, it is. It's just a, a GUI, right? It basically is like you can access uh, the underlying KVM on each hypervisor host you're running. All the version commands will, will work. Um, so, so it, it really just, yeah, it, it gives, but that's what we wanted, right? Yeah. We want to be able to, to, uh, uh, to go in and, and look at the domain definitions or whatever. We, we, it's nice that it's a QCOW2 image that we can grab and, and move somewhere else if we really had. Um, what else? Oh, uh, there is also a serial console option. Uh, do, you, do you have one where it's available? Yeah, there's nothing available. Like, I don't there, know. there was one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. so, and you didn't. It's not perfect. OK. Uh, the serial console has some issues which we couldn't figure out why, where it, KVM sets up the wrong 
instead of a PTY, it, it sets a Unix domain socket, and then over doesn't know what to do that, so you have to make so this it is a virtual, virtual serial console or yeah. an actual physical all, serial console? All of our advanced management for the VART is a serial console, and we've gotten really used to that, so we're looking to do the same thing here, and the principle offers it, but we run it as a is serial like you configure a serial line on each of your guests? And yes. The console and that's how we have it. Oh, I see. All right. That's and then you can actually SSH into what is what the guest thinks. So it's a special SSH version. port, and then once you authenticate, you're actually directly connected to the guest serial, serial console. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we have it. We we got it to to work, but with some manual tweaking because the right file wasn't in the right place for where Overt was looking for it. So I don't know what that is. Uh, right. Um, that concludes the demo. Uh, where are you? Okay, do one of you want to take over this part again? Okay, so um, that was what we found when we played with uh, Over. Um, most of this has already been talked about. We looked at other solutions just sort of on paper to see what would fit. We looked at Proxmox, OpenStack, RHEV, and vSphere. For Proxmox, it's not libvirt based, so that's not something we've done in the past that didn't look like a good fit. It also seems to be tailing off in terms of development. OpenStack was just too big. Um, it can do a lot of things, and it's probably the, the way to go if you have way more to manage, but we don't have that much. RHEV is over, plus some support, and probably better patches and stuff. And, and, and if you're looking at, if you look at uh, Rev web pages or, or data sheets, it's kind of hard to see what exactly they add on top of over, because a lot of their features uh, that they highlight seem to be the same features that are in over. Everything so might be just over plus a over over upstream for RGB. So if it's not in over, it's not in RGB in general. And um, this year, uh, well, and RGB is going to be fairly expensive for us. We don't have exact pricing yet. And um, vSphere would probably also be quite expensive. But more worryingly for us was it's kind of opaque and you don't know what's happening a lot of the time. It's black box and hope for the best. And um, we also have been looking at uh, other options for running VMs, so that would be EduCloud, Compute Canada's OpenStack, or the commercial offerings. Um, EduCloud's probably going to be fine for some of the stuff. And um, where it's not fine is we have like that cluster or stuff, so where if you have machines with a lot of CPUs, it starts getting expensive or awkward, and just way more flexible to have the stuff in-house as well. Um, the commercial thing is probably going to be interesting depending on how the licensing plans are for the data protection stuff. Uh, okay, so the, the good stuff that we liked about Over is it actually has a UI. It's not just shell scripts anymore. Um, there's user and admin portals. Probably of those, the user portal is way more important. The admin portal we could live without, but the user portal we need something for our users to be able to interact with. Um, it gets back to sort of the dream of treating your hypervisors as building blocks. We can set up a bunch of kickstart scripts whenever we get new hardware, netboot them, and they'll pick up for configuration, and they're basically done. You can go into the over interface and add them. That's then added to the cluster, and that's all of our new CPUs and memory. Um, also helps us with the policy problems. It's a single point of entry. Everybody's using the same thing, and we can enforce some of the policies through the UI. Um, and there's no real lock-in that we found. Like It's very much just running libvirt in the background. It's managing libvirt for us. So if we had a problem, we could fall back on libvirt. <coughs> so you mentioned the user portals as uh, an important yeah. um, What do you see as providing the, the ability to provision new one? Or, or start and stop? Existing start and stop is a big one, yeah. Um, Get on their consoles. I'm sorry, reboot or then reboot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. big one. Does this no longer support requests? Um, then the bad stuff. Uh, there are a lot of bugs. Well, actually, I guess I should start with the learning curve. Has been big for us. It might not be big if you're already running vSphere or something else, but we had a lot to learn. Um, some things have been tricky so far. I tried adding networks, and it didn't go that well. 
the user permission system is big um, and we just don't understand it fully yet. The certificate system is also a bit tricky to manage. There's a lot of UI exceptions, there's a definitely a lot of bugs in it, so you're clicking around doing what you think is the right thing or what the documentation tells you is the right thing and you get errors and then you're off to looking at log files to try and figure out what went wrong. Um, as Davr showed with the ISOs and importing and exporting, you're still dropping back to the command line for a fair number of things to get them working. <laughs> but I guess the biggest one at the moment is the console issues. So if we would like to offer Spice or RDP for users to interact with their VMs, it's just, there's a lot of rough corners. You can get some things working, but not everything. The Spice just is not a good idea at the moment. Like when you get it working Windows to Windows, it's really nice. To, like the sound works on your VM and all of this stuff, and it's just really fast and responsive, but it's a lot of effort to get it running, and there's a lot of client support issues, especially for OS X. Uh, we also just talked about the console idea, so being able to get an out-of-band management port on the, the VMs without having to know where it's running. So at the moment, if I want console in my LDAP machine, I have to figure out which hypervisor it's running on, and then go and first console on that hypervisor, with the console proxy, it sets up an SSH port that we SSH into telling it which machine we want to connect to, and we get wired through to the console transparently. Um, yet there's a lot of bugs, and we've been quite a lot of bugs. I guess to ameliorate that, there is a lot of development, and they are responding to the bugs. Okay, so stuff that we didn't really look at that we probably would want to before we used in production. Um, network configurations, the user system, the backup and restore we haven't really played with, but in principle it's just backup the PostgreSQL database, the PostgreSQL database of the machine information, and some configuration files for over, and you're done. Um, the hosted engine that Tay talked about would also be nice in a sort of higher availability thing. Um, so if we went for clustered file systems, we would have the option of doing this hosted engine thing and being resilient to the individual hypervisors going down without us really having to worry all that much about it. Um, summing up, uh, Over is a good fit for us because it uses libvirt in the background. It's just a management layer on top of libvirt, if you can look at it that way. It's big and complex, but hopefully not too big and complex. Um, and there's a lot of development going on. They're fixing a lot of stuff. Um, 3.7 should be interesting, and we're interested enough in it to keep the what we have going. Probably it'll be a wipe and reinstall just to see the things that we need are fixed and keep playing with it that way. We do, in the mid-term, see a place for it in our infrastructure, probably starting with like development machines, then maybe bringing on some applications, and we're probably, we wouldn't be comfortable putting critical services on it yet, so we'll keep Libvirt or existing Libvirt set up for that at the moment, but if it's stabilized and lived up to its promises, then we'll probably shift everything to over in the long term. But that seems to be quite far away. That's, that's everything we have. Your boxes are dual interface? Sorry? Your boxes are dual interface? Or not? Uh, not at the moment. They're single interface. They can be however many physical interfaces. That yeah, you have. I was just wondering what recommendations they have given that you're using NFS for your images. Uh, Probably. No, I mean, this is presumably standard recommendations for doing libvirt over NFS kind of stuff. So, in the slide, uh, K, uh, KVM uh, Summit in Seattle 2005, uh, in August, the guy go detail about the hyperconvergent. Like, um, they talk about NFS at one point of, you need only one, you have only one IP, and that basically, if you break that IP chain, you're dead, right? So did they talk about uh, uh, leave it, uh, cluster FS with multiple um, uh, accessing points and you don't have the storage uh, value? Do you have the slide for the, the three? That's thing? cool slides we have. Yeah, but a, a lot of that stuff is all recommending 10 gig just for all the metadata that they're, those boxes are well, scrubbing around and question, How usable is it with one gig? Right? Yeah. Seth's the same thing, right? They're recommending 10 gig for, all, for the back end of Seth. Yeah. The, I don't think there's a lot of traffic in, within the, the uh, over the south, right? No, no, not within yeah. over, but, yeah. but you were talking about cluster, right? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's a different. And that's why yeah. we don't want to even dimension of cluster over here because it's a different problem, right? So, yeah. so how, how usable is it with what gigabit back end? 
or you have to scale it? Uh, well, we haven't got a whole lot of data points to go yeah. on, um, but we have 10 gig interfaces in the machines. It would just be if that was part of it. if that was going to cause us a problem, we could fix it. Yeah. So our uh, donut hours uh, UDC uh, racks are all 10 gig uh, internal, right? except for the meta because they come with one gig. Then you know so. For NFS. Yeah. There's a future for multipath. Mm. And over. Deliver. Not that I know. Of. Well, I, I don't know. Probably. Like, uh, we people a lot bigger than in, a lot bigger than our installation are using. And um, I think University of Seville, sixty thousand CMs. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. For BDI, yeah. 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 same as trunking or multipath. No. no. It's actually. <laughs> You know, we probably worry a little bit too much about multipath or whatever, right? <laughs> Through our experience, we're using KVM for six years. The only thing you, you, you I see in downtime is your darn storage go down. Switch and, and that is the yeah. most happening. Switch happen. doesn't happen. I don't, I don't worry about a network yet, right? I'm not any yeah. switch failure. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's the cheapest switch. They're HP lifetime support, dude. <laughs> I gotta replace the next day, it's okay. <laughs> they do not know. So, I guess they should have as much we expect. Any other questions? Alright, I'm still working. Thank you guys.